Alright. Hey everybody, welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show and uh, my summer interview series called Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture. And today is very special because not only is it special because of the guests that we have today, but also it's special because if you guys have been following my work uh, for the last, since August 2nd of last year, which would have been Thursday, August 2nd, 2012, when I interviewed Mick Alderman, who uh, uh, wrote a book about the his uh, life with the Goonies uh, when uh, he was around, uh, when he was a, a kid uh, watching the Goonies being made uh, in, the, in Astoria, Oregon, where he uh, lives. Uh, since then, I have done 59 other interviews, and actually this one will mark 60 since... Uh, August first of last or August second of last year. Now that we're getting close to August second of this year already, and uh, also number forty of people who I've chatted with uh, in 2013, I give you uh, author Nicholas Grabowski. How are you? Yeah, doing good. <laughs> doing good. I hope that was a good. I hope that was a good introduction for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. Gee, I'm staring at uh, uh, what my fiance Francie wrote in the kitchen on the little uh, dry erase board. Uh, little tiny hamsters everywhere. She has a picture of a hamster, and I'm staring at it. Oh boy! <laughs> going, wow. Well, Life's little meanings. I guess so. I was I was just going to say, geez, you guys collect hamsters? <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a hamster. As a matter of fact, we got uh, on Vedel dot com. We have. Um, um, a uh, uh, web TV channel called Black Hamster, oh. and uh, so our current hamster is always our mascot. Uh, we've gone through uh, well one of them so far. This is our second one, <laughs> but it shows like um, uh, we just put up uh, a lot of uh, independent short horror films and uh, a lot of like black bedsheet book trailers and you know uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, if anybody wants to ever go down there, it's not always on. Uh, the intent is to always have it on whenever you go to that station you can like see it oh, but uh, it's whenever I have the time so, oh yeah oh, but, uh, uh, about uh, 300 I think of, no no that's Francis uh, um, I think I have over 100,000 hits or something on it so far well I suppose so you would fine. I suppose fine. you would you're, you're very you're, you know people are people know your work I mean I I, you know, I tell you what, you know, when when, uh, when you clicked uh, that you liked one of my statuses for, I think it was either a guest that I was having on or something like that, I don't really remember what it was, but I, I checked you out, you know, because I was kind of wondering, you know, because it was on that pop culture channel that's on Facebook, and uh, that's oh, yeah. how I, I mean, we were friends before that, but I didn't know you until I clicked, until you liked one of my statuses or whatever of a guest that I had on, and then, uh, I went and I looked at your Facebook page to see who you were, see if you're just a, a regular person or just a, or somebody that's actually done something with pop culture or whatever. And and I was shocked to find out that you uh, you're, you're an author, you know, you're a book writer, and I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I've been doing that kind of thing since. Uh, well, I've been writing all of my life ever since I could write. Ever since uh, probably the third grade, when uh, teacher. Uh, in the class uh, got us to write tall tales and instead of just writing one I wrote a, a one a week for the rest of the year and read them in front of the class and so I, I, I but professionally that was the mid 80s and uh, my first mass market paperback through Critics Choice Paperbacks uh, was uh, Praise Up in the Spirit. it was the first thing that I ever wrote the first novel I ever wrote and finished and uh, they accepted that, and that led to Halloween Four, the novelization for that, mm-hmm. and the Ragman, and then a, a plethora of like uh, work for hire type stuff, where I'd do romance novels and exercise books because I needed the money. I had a security job at the time, overnight security at a construction site, and when I got published, I thought, "Ooh, I had it made." <laughs> so, but the publisher was good enough to keep sending me these uh, these projects and stuff. So I ended up, like, over the years, um, just getting a, a ton of, like, this and that's published and these horror novels in between. And then in the 90s, I kind of took a break from the horror novel thing because I was obsessed with a book I was working on called The Adderborn, which is kind of like an alien fantasy horror uh-huh. everything kind of a book. And that took me 12 years to write, and I told myself, I'm not going to do anything else in the writing field until I finished this book, and I finally finished it around 2001. And so then uh, uh, I came out with stuff after that, 
and uh, I just yeah. So wow. Yeah, I've, uh, <laughs> I I think I'm one of the few people that have had the privilege or the luck to have had their first novel published and just off the bat and put in m into mass market paperback in grocery stores and bookstores and things. And the downside to that is I kind of got screwed and I uh, didn't get paid and all kinds of other things. So I haven't like really had uh, um, a status of like a big top-notch writer, but I, yeah, that's what I'm striving for. That's what the ladder of the mountain is for. <laughs> I am still doing it, like, sure. oh, about 30 years later. Wow, so, but, wow. Yeah, but I have a lot more momentum and a lot more behind me now. And I've got a publishing company now and all oh. kinds of stuff. So, so I think... Uh, are there, of, huh? uh, uh, yeah. are there, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's okay. Are, are there a lot of uh, well-known authors that, that know your, of your work? Uh, yeah, you know, I think, to be honest... I think most of the well-known authors know of me versus they have read me. Uh -huh. um, I, I'm not really entirely sure. I know that there's a lot of well-known authors um, that, uh, like, for instance, Brian Keene. Um, he told me when I met him that he bought um, Halloween 4, my novelization, um, when it first came out, and like so many of... Uh, uh, just regular people have come up to me and said, yeah, when I was in junior high school, I bought that book, and I read it cover to cover like five times, and and uh, it's, it's so great, it's better than the movie and stuff. And he was one of those people. And so it, it's great that, some, that I come across um, some well-known writers that uh, uh, actually knew that Nicholas Krapowski existed back then. <laughs> so, but I think in the last maybe... 10 or 13 years, my popularity has grown a little bit more. I, I think a lot of that, that has a lot to do with I've been able to uh, just go out to the conventions and meet the authors, and then they know who I am, and they go, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, like um, uh, Rick Haudela, who recently passed away, he uh, was a, a big, well-known author, and he uh, started out around the same time that I did and uh, where uh, both of our, our early mass market paperbacks were on the same shelves. And uh, uh, he had bared me when we had a few really good conversations and he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, but, but, yeah, so, you know. Yeah, well, that's, that's cool, though. The, and the reason why I ask is because it's like... Uh, you know, I don't know, like, like okay, library the area in our in this town that I live in right now before I moved to Dakota. Uh, like, in a lot of local libraries? Well, I'd be lucky to see if um, maybe Halloween Foreign Prey Serpent's Prey might be um, from back in the early days. It's kind of, especially Prey Serpent's Prey is kind of rare. Uh, like, we find the Halloween 4 thing in libraries. Some of the other books... I don't know, like the what like stuff that I used to do, just you know, just to make ends meet. You can't find that stuff anywhere, really, that I know of. Uh, sometimes I search, but the later stuff, probably the Everborn, you can find in libraries, um, and uh, you you probably could find Red Wet Dirt. I haven't really looked. It's just it's, uh, I'm having a hard enough time trying to get my own authors and my publishing company into libraries. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. Uh, but yeah. might have spanned a couple of decades, so there might be a couple of points where a library got a hold of something. So where did the love for uh, uh, writing books kind of just uh, happen for you? I mean, I know you talked about when you were a kid, but like, like what kind of just inspired you to just kind of to, to, to do this? Oh, oh, you know, I think uh, when I was a kid, I had an imagination where I would have imaginary friends. Um, like... Uh, I guess as far back as kindern, uh, I just, I had a weird life. Um, but uh, I, I actually really was brought up in a normal family, but uh, uh, there's something about me, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd <laughs> like stay up late at night in bed talking to Wiley e. Coyote and Dracula, <laughs> and I would uh, tell them to go out uh, at, out on the town and find 
this girl that's in the classroom that I see every day in kindergarten and um, and and tell me what she's doing and bring her back to me and you know and to, I mean I had crushes on girls in kindergarten and I used uh, pretend vampires uh, to to seek them out at night and bring them back to me <laughs> and Wiley Coyote was one of them and he's not you know he's a cartoon coyote sure but the thing is that by uh, by the time of the end of kindergarten I thought that I was a super vampire and I would flap my wings my uh, my jacket like wings in at recess time and I would bite girls on the arms and sometimes draw blood and get you know sent home <laughs> well, and I broke a kid's arm once it went all the way up to about the end of the fourth grade that I thought it was this it was so weird oh wow but uh, I had such an imagination that I wanted to write things down and um like I was saying in my uh, third grade class when uh, um we were all told to write uh, our own tall tales. We were, actually, we were shown a lot of those old Disney um, uh, shorts, like Paul Bunyan and oh, and uh, you know and and Pecos Bill and stuff. So that kind of inspired me to actually write on paper what I was thinking in my head and to turn them into stories. And they were really wild stories. And by the sixth grade, when I actually decided that I was a real human being and I wasn't really a vampire, and I figured, okay, well, just like. Um, drop the charade and uh, um, I uh, I started writing I wrote like a little book called the Star Wars Chronicle when Star Wars came out it was all about the Star Wars characters coming to our school and Darth Vader taking it over <laughs> and Han Solo and, and Luke and Leia saving us and then this white Darth Vader that was actually me uh, would help save them too and it was like you know and, uh, and then I developed this um, comic strip in the sixth grade of Gooneyville, and I got all of my friends to draw their own comics, too, and stuff. And I would send them to Jack and Jill magazine and would almost get them published. Oh, wow. There would be, be people at Jack and Jill that <laughs> would be rooting for me, but ultimately, no. And then I just kept writing. I, I kept writing scripts in junior high and scripts in high school. And uh, I would always present them to my English teacher, and on the side, he'd like take a look at it for me and then I'd submit to Hollywood and you know <laughs> and uh, I got I got a few good responses but still I mean story of my life up until now nothing's been produced Jeez. of mine but um, um, that got me actually started with uh, um, my first novel Prairie Serpents Prey that ultimately got published um, I started that in my 10th grade high school math class because I was bored and uh that um, ended up by I ended up writing some of it in the kitchen of a friend's house and on napkins and stuff and then um, I ended up wanting to well I couldn't decide what I wanted to do in life and I filled like many shoes I was a preacher just right out of high school because I was heavily influenced and involved and immersed in evangelical church oh. Uh, and with the whole speaking in tongues thing and everything, <laughs> my parents like steeple chased sure. so much that we went through all kinds of like different um, uh, Christian conservative churches. And one really wacky Christian cult that didn't believe in television or Christmas called the local church of Witness Lee yeah, in yes. Anaheim. But uh, I, I mean, I just went through all kinds of different weird things. And you know, funny thing is, in high school. I was so heavily involved in the church scene that people that would talk about horror movies and horror books, and especially Halloween, um, when that came out, I was saying, I, I would tell them, you know, that's really, you, do you really want to watch movies like that that fill your mind with, uh, with satanic images? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 shame on you. You should watch good, wholesome, rated G movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, and, uh, and then uh, I just, I think, you know, um, after a while, you know, Prey Serpent's Prey originally was supposed to be a Christian allegory. Um, kind of like uh, it, it had to do with a um, uh, pastor that runs a town militantly, practically. And then these vampires come and take it over, and he has to use the power of Jesus and the kids that uh, develop friendships with them and stuff. They all have to learn about the power of Jesus to exercise the demons from the town, basically. But I was going through a really sticky situation with a girlfriend of mine that uh, ended up 
having my first son, and that caused a lot of controversy in in the church. And um, she happened to be having an affair with a pastor of a mental institution um, uh, that uh, 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 she kind of ran away from home at one point when we were... um, uh, our relationship was on the downside, and this couple turned out to be uh, a minister and his wife of a uh, local uh, hospital that had like a mental ward. And I got to be friends with them because she was living there. And um, we would have Bible studies there in the apartment. And then on Sunday mornings, I would bring a keyboard and I would kind of play songs, and people would sing and stuff and uh, worship. Uh, to my little piano playing on my keyboard, and then he would like uh, he was actually a pastor of this, and he ended up having an affair, and and I was involved in that. So at that time, I had enough of church, and something woke up in me and told me that I should uh, I should just um, do what I feel is in my heart to do, and. That was getting pissed off at everything and learning about, you know, if you judge other people, other people are going to judge you sure. and stuff. And I told myself, I'm not going to judge people for believing anything else. I used to be one of those militant Christians that would walk into malls with like 20 people behind me and pass out um, literature and Bibles and <laughs> stuff. Um, so, you know, after that, uh, around about 1988, that's when I first got published, too. And that's when my life kind of split in two. And I decided to just be my own man. I still believe in the same basic principles of the Bible and such, but it's more like there's enough horror in the Bible. Why is horror so wrong? It's not wrong. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, and writing about horror is not wrong. And even swearing, it's not wrong because it's just another way of talking, you know, yeah. um, and, and expression. And you know, all the things that were taboo, I just kind of, you know, laid my cards out on the table and just let life take me. So over the years now, I've developed a a real passion, not just for my own writing, but for other people's horror writing and stuff, too. I figure if you decide what it is you want to do in life, and you know that for sure, then you've got to um, saturate yourself in that industry. You've got to know the people. You've got to want to better yourself. You've got to want to... um, I've set an example for others, and, you know, the whole thing. If I was a janitor, if that's what like, God uh, or the universe wanted me to be was a janitor, I'd be going to, and if I took it seriously, I'd be, um, I, I'd be putting my commercials on TV. I'd be going to janitor conventions. You know, so it's the same kind of thing. Oh. And uh, so now my whole life is like now I'm a writer and publisher and everything, trying to learn all the mechanics and, uh, and applying them. <laughs> so, I didn't think I was well. Yeah. I just no, talked a lot there. No, that's okay. That's okay. And, and like I said, with my show, there is no there is no time limit. So we can go for at least, you know, as long as you want. It doesn't have to be an hour, but, you know, you know, to talk. I mean, this is a bio interview anyway. We're talking about your life, and we're talking with author Nick Grabowski. And uh, one question I had, you mentioned that you had a son. Uh, is he, uh, like, following your footsteps in the writing at all? Is, what was that again? Uh, you, you mentioned that you had a son. Is, is he uh, inspired to do some writing, too, just like you are? Oh, actually, yes. He's a little dyslexic. Um, but he's, uh, and he had a hard growing up um, and stuff because we were separated most of the time. Yeah. And, and then uh, around 95, I had to move up to Sacramento and fly down there just to, you know, go to court to find out where the hell he was. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and it's a long story, but yeah. um, but uh, uh, he actually the, the the wonders of Facebook. Uh, we we talk all the time on Facebook, <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's um, better than talking on the phone because sometimes I could be phonophobic. Yeah. But uh, we keep in touch that way, and that's cool. I also have another son, um, Charlie, who's. Uh, um, Seven right now, and he's uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, he's nine. <laughs> and, uh, Uh-oh. I had to think about it. I almost forgot how old you're. I see him every every other weekend, oh, okay. and um, 
Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's really cool. So now, I, I I think that's it for me as far as kids. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have any kids yet. I'm 29 years old. And I never. My brother, and my sister have kids, but I just never. It's not that I'm not responsible enough. It's just that I'm not ready. You know, and I'm one of those guys that just kind of. I mean, I've been with I've been with a girl before, but I was just, I was trying to be safe, you know, but rather than sorry. It wasn't the right time yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, oops. Oops. <laughs> I, I felt exactly the same way, but then, oops. Yeah. And uh, sometimes life just, I mean, you know, uh, you can look at it one way. If I just remained abstinent <laughs> or whatever, then, you know, I, all the bases are covered. But you just can't do that. But uh, but uh, but uh, yeah. Something. But like but being a father though, uh, and not to be, get too personal or whatever. But uh, being a father, does that inspire you to to keep on writing more and more, or is that just more just because you got to pay the bills and stuff? Um, no, actually, um, actually, life inspires me to write. Okay. Um, I think uh, part of the mechanics behind me writing uh, is I I think and I've thought about this, I've done a lot of thinking, um, is uh, I, I think part of me is a little obsessed with memory and um, and uh, um, I guess whenever it is that I die, I'll be able to, all the all the experiences, yeah. uh, this is kind of like, uh, what's his name, the, the bad guy, Blade Runner. Um, um, oh, I don't remember, I, I've always seen Blade Runner. his name, but uh, when he was talking about at the end, of the movie uh, uh, about his memories and stuff, losing his memories, all of his thoughts and you know the stuff that he's been through yeah. can be lost forever. And I, uh, I, I'd rather write and uh, and even you know write and fictionalize it, and make it fun. Um, but still, it's like part of me that's in there that I'm leaving behind. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of journals earlier on. I'm just. <laughs> I've been so busy lately, I don't even have time to write, let alone write journals, but when my son, my first son was born, I, um, I uh, these three really super long journals with like little illustrations and stuff in them, and um, they, they chronicle almost my daily from, uh, from uh, the time that I met his mother in the mid-80s until about 92. Oh, <laughs> so, oh wow. Um, yeah, so that, I actually, I did a lot of writing back then because I had to see that I had that going on. I was writing the other stuff that was published, too. Definitely. And then I was employed as an editor and different things um, back then uh, occasionally. So I was like, yeah, I've always been busy. Damn. <laughs> and I've always been a big fan of the of the Halloween movie series. I actually, uh, if, if whenever you get a chance to look back at some of the other interviews that I've done, I've actually interviewed both uh, Dick Warlock, who was the uh, shape in uh, Halloween 2, the original from 1981, and I also interviewed his son, Lance Warlock, who was the boombox boy, uh, now uh, a, uh, a scorer now for uh, soundtracks and stuff like that, but uh, at the time, he was a boombox boy, and I got to interview him as well, so uh, it's always been a favorite series of mine. How, uh, how is the Halloween 4 book different from the movie? Well, you know, I I was young and inexperienced back when I got the opportunity to do the Halloween Four novelization, and yeah, um, I just got my first novel published, and then uh, opportunities like this, especially, came along. Uh, just you know, all of a sudden, you know, phone call. It's <laughs> my publisher saying, "How'd you like to do Halloween Four? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, so and I had a month to do it too. Oh wow. So, and I I was wondering if I should add, like, my own stuff to it, and I, I thought the best solution would be just to uh, to take the screenplay, not stray too much, uh, just uh, put, uh, personalize it a little bit so that only family and friends, like, no. Um, but uh, I, I just kind of figured that uh, the rule of thumb should be, uh, lest I get myself in trouble, um, just kind of write it straight. But I had a lot of things, uh, uh, ideas of, of stuff that I wanted to add, and I made some notes, and, and some of it I actually wrote, and I just put aside. Later on, when I started learning this publishing thing, and the advent of Prime the Man and so forth, uh, um, I and after I finished The Everborn, I was wondering what to do with that. 
I um, was thinking, you know what? Um, maybe if I approached Trankus Films, I can get a special limited edition of that Halloween 4 book with all the stuff added back into it that was mine. And uh, and he was all for it, Malika Cod over at Trankus. And uh, um, so I did the special edition where I, I just... Um, yeah, all the stuff that I wanted to see myself, it, it still doesn't stray from uh, uh, from the whole premise and the plot and everything. It's just additional things like Reverend Sayer, um, mm-hmm. the guy that picks up Loomis in the pickup truck. Yeah, uh, I, I have like two or three chapters devoted to him. Oh, um, so, so that was really cool being able to do that because it got some things off my chest with Halloween Four. Uh, and I kind of wish that I, I, I don't know why, I've kind of been a little unresponsive uh, to um, a lot of my ideas and projects of uh, getting more Michael Myers literature out there. I, I want to do an anthology um, with uh, just original Halloween-inspired short stories with some famous writers, and uh, that almost um, took off, and then I stopped getting responses. <laughs> from Frank is so, and there's a lot of stuff that I'd want to do if given the opportunity to, to further, you know, yeah. Michael's adventures in literature. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would definitely be something because uh, you know, I mean, Michael Myers. You know, I I met you know he was pretty freaky. I mean, when I first, uh, well, when I was a little kid, I didn't know how movies were made at the time. Uh, uh, they were pretty scary when you, when you watch a horror movie. That's why I don't think I watched many when I was a kid. I I started to get into the horror scene more or less. Uh, when I joined YouTube, and I seen that there was a lot of people that actually love horror, and that when it comes to like these conventions stuff that I've never been to yet, but like like Comic Con and all that stuff, there's a people, a lot of people that love horror so much that uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just it's like one of the biggest genres of uh, of entertainment. It seems like when it comes to the, that type of genre for horror, and people love it. And I started to get into the you know, the Halloween series and the. Freddy and the Jason, the Chucky, and all that stuff, and and now I watch them and I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I always have to see them. I, just, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've loved horror movies, and I think the uh, the first horror movie that really got to me wasn't really a horror movie at all. It was it was the Mad Mon- the Monster Party um, by um, Rankin and Bass who did the Riddle of the Red Nosed Reindeer and, and yeah. all that and yeah. stuff. And that was great. It had, like, Boris Karloff's voice and, and Phyllis Diller and, and it was something that you could sing along with. Okay. Um, and it had all the monsters. Uh, so, you know, that. that thing kind of uh, inspired me throughout my life because I saw that and probably in kindergarten. Probably what got the whole vampire thing going with me back then, too. It, was, uh, it affected me so much. And then I latched on to horror movies and stuff in early age and and uh uh you know so uh, well that's cool yeah uh and uh this you got this news now that uh you might be uh making an appearance on dr phil have you decided yet <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah to bring that up yep, I still, to. <laughs> well, at the end of this interview i still don't really know what to do there's um about it uh uh, I've gotten some good advice both ways and stuff, uh, you know, to go, not to go, and um, is it going to tarnish uh, horror writers in general by going? And I think the general consensus and fear is that um, um, they're saying that the Dr. Phil show is highly manipulated and that the stuff that you want to say, they'll cut out, they'll turn things on you, uh, and yeah, I don't know. Um <laughs> I don't know, because they, they do that, but they don't do that 100% of the time. Sometimes it seems like, it, you know, there's, like, um, special shows that they have where yeah. they're a little bit more nerved about it, and the people genuinely get help, which got me started on this, because uh, my concern is actually for a guy that I've, I've kind of known that um, um, he uh, he's actually made death threats to other writers, and he mm-hmm. goes a little bit nuts. Uh, and and he's just well hated throughout the horror writing industry and um, I just want to get him some help okay. and I thought Dr. Phil <laughs> uh, but uh, you know there's just so many layers to that uh, well like did they tell I'm not did, sure did they tell you kind of what the uh, the subject matter was that they're going to be talking about 
Uh, no, actually. And you know what? Stupid me. I was drunk when I actually wrote to Dr. Phil about it. Uh, was I, I uh, for some crazy reason, I forgot to um, uh, copy, paste, and save what I wrote to them. So I can only just barely remember any of it. But, I, you know, I, um, I have a good idea what I wrote, and it's all pretty much what I've been saying. But yeah. uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I should just shine it, or maybe I should go. But uh, the thing is, I've tried to get some cooperation from other horror writers too, and they they think that it's um, uh, a noble thing to do. Yeah. But they don't want to have anything to do with it, and I and I mean, so I don't know. But you know, that's one thing is. Uh, Sometimes you just got to, like, um, poke around a little bit for opportunities and stuff. Sure. For things that, you, if something all of a sudden inspires you, sometimes you should go for it. And um, I kind of figured in my mind that there was a chance that maybe I could get this guy some help and set him on the right course. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, it's the beauty about some of these reality shows, yeah. uh, if, if, if you could call it beauty, is that some people really do get help, especially like in the Gordon Ramsay stuff, like Kitchen Nightmares. I mean, yeah. man, you know, if I had a restaurant, I'd love for him to come and renovate mine <laughs> <laughs> and on his dime and yeah. everything. So, and Dr. Phil does that with um, with psychology. Yeah. And a lot of people get like um, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of help that they can't normally afford through Dr. Phil, no matter how much he sensationalizes or... Or, you know, I mean, the fact is, some of these people actually do get help. Yeah. Um, I don't know for how long, but, I mean, uh, I don't know. I Sometimes I come up with, like, these hair-brained ideas. <laughs> and some of them work, some of them don't. Well, if you ever if you ever do do it, uh, I actually watch the Dr. Bill show once in a while. I, I Well, my parents kind of got me hooked on it because it's part of their little routine. Sometimes they like to watch it at 4 o'clock on NBC used to be on CBS, but now it's on NBC now. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if you ever do go on, I mean, it'd be great to, it'd be great to see you. It'd be interesting whatever you guys talk about. Uh, if, if I were you, I mean, I, you know, I would uh, try to make it more about your book, you know, like if you're, if you're currently writing another, another novel or whatever, because it, you know, it's not often that you get a chance to be on TV, you know, and most people probably would like to know uh, the man behind the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think so. I, I, um, uh, a lot of people tell me that they would probably like cut out most of that or something. But I, I would imagine that being it uh, about horror writing, it would be inherent that uh, you know they'd say, okay, Nicholas Grabel's the author of this and that and stuff. He's the owner of Black Dead Sheet Books. But the thing is, going on the show, uh, that that would be just um, uh, of yeah. me going on the show. Okay. Uh, and then that I can make the horror writing industry as a whole look greater than I, I perceive uh, uh, the general population yeah. uh, perceives it to be. I, I am kind of a little militant about getting us um, back um, in our own sections. At the I used to work in bookstores where I would stock the, ho the horror section in bookstores, oh. and they, there's no horror section anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so that would be a good, like... Um, uh, you know, uh, I think service for the industry. If I would were to be able to get uh, appreciation for horror writing and horror literature uh, on national TV, but still, so, you know, some uh, you just never know. I, I I, there's probably <laughs> other ways for me to do that, though. Yeah. Too, I can like just on my own. I was thinking about this too. Uh, I could just on my own go on other shows. Yeah. Um, and promote my books and talk about that too, without having to to um, to, to put this guy on TV and, and have it on him. So there's just all kinds of different things. Yeah, I just want him to get out. But uh, so I thought that that would be a, a sensational way in all kinds sure. of ways. So uh, is is Ca is California pretty much where you uh, were born and raised, kind of? Oh yeah, I've been in California all my life. Half of my life has been in Southern California, and the other half. So far, um, up in uh, Northern California in the Sacramento area. Huh. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I've been born and raised in Minnesota, and finally I just decided it's time to move on. I'm only 29 years old, and 
Um, I have family in, in the Black Hills of South Dakota that live over there, so I'm going to go and uh, and live with them and uh, you know start my own journey and hope. And who knows? I'm thinking. I'm hoping that some of these interviews might land me a possible radio job because uh, you know the radio stations wanted like a uh, uh, like an audition tape. When I said I don't have an audition tape, but I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, take a look at what I've done on my, on the YouTube channel and uh, get back to me. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, you're welcome to stop on by Friends and Friends anytime you want to, too, and plug your show. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, uh, I've actually gotten offers from uh, a few other people that have done radio shows, too, but I've never they, I, I've never got back to them, I guess. But I would love to. Uh, once I get to South Dakota and get settled in, I would, yeah, I would, I would definitely like to do that. Because uh, I will be working, but I but I will uh, I will have time. Yeah, um, other and people like you too, uh, <laughs> like um, uh, Miss Misery uh, and Mr. Lobo. But uh, I think of note is Joe Finn, who's a co-host of the show, and he's also a horror host that has his own like uh, horror cable show where he does interviews and stuff. And it's local over in San Jose, and uh, and so it's very similar. And he puts it up on YouTube. Oh, cool. um, so we seem to like uh, you know it's of like-minded people. Yeah, and together somewhere somehow. I see you also mm-hmm. like uh, like in uh, like I was checking out that that interview stuff that you your radio show you uh, like on, on your Facebook page or, or on her fa- Facebook page all the guests uh-huh. that you get all the guests that you guys have had and you even got like the guy uh, the guy who was a married with children uh, David I forget what his last name was but uh, he was a miller Mar- oh. Bud Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I his name's on the tip of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what um, the last name. Yeah, was. he was he was one of uh, Francie's earlier guests. Too. Yeah. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. You know that he was able able to to come on board. A lot of other people that you had on, I don't really recognize, but there's a there's probably a few that I did. You know that I recognize. You know what's funny is I think the most important person that she's interviewed was Solomon Burke. Uh, uh, legendary soul singer Rolling Stones um, uh, they uh, they say that they wouldn't exist without Solomon Burke oh, wow. uh, and uh, he he recently passed but uh, uh, but before he did he was on her show twice and he really had a blast uh, so much so that uh, we were invited to his funeral and his wake oh, wow. and we couldn't make it to the funeral but we just drove uh, all the way down eight hours down to L.A. And we went to the wake, and Francie ended up doing a speech at the <laughs> wake uh, uh, right after the owner of the Grammy Awards did his speech. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and it was so cool. I wish I could have filmed it, but, you know, you just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, But that yeah. was really neat, and there were some other cool people there, too, and that's all because of her show. Oh, jeez. Uh, like we were talking about before um, before you started recording about how... Uh, uh, you know, just um, in this day and age, uh, just like we are now, just talking over the phone and stuff. It's amazing how where that leads to. If you do it for interviews, and yeah. then, then more people want to be uh, interviewed by you, and this is just um, this is a lot of good luck. Well, yeah, by, uh, doing that. Yeah, and, and I'm like I said too. I mean, I was just so surprised that. Uh, how many people have said yes? If everybody that I've uh, sent an interview request out said yes, by now I probably would have done over two hundred interviews. That's how that's how dedicated I am to it. <laughs> wow! <laughs> but only a few said yes. But that's you know. But I understand. I mean, people are busy and stuff, and then, you know, it's just it's the nature of the beast. And uh, I'm I'm not a big name, you know. I'm not uh, somebody that's uh, been doing this for years upon years. I'm just I'm kind of new to all this stuff, and I just. Uh, wanted to use what my radio background gave me and uh, the experience of learning how to do a proper radio interview. So, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got lots of experience now. You do have a good radio voice. Oh, too. oh thank you. I, I, I've, I've spent time on the, on the air. I've uh, I volunteered at the local uh, radio station that, that was actually the same uh, the place that I went to college at. I didn't uh, graduate from the college department, but after volunteering for so many years, I I just established myself, and I learned more than I ever did in one year of broadcasting school. So uh, maybe I don't have a degree that says I, you know, deserve to be a, a broadcaster, but I have all the experience. So that to me is a win, a win-win. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, other than that, uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, coming on board uh, and, and uh, let me chat with you. This is uh, this is fun. You actually, the, the next person that I interview is a very iconic uh, somebody who is a folk singer, uh, Trini Lopez. I'm sure you've heard of him before. Uh, I think so. I think so. Yeah, he did like the what? Lemon Tree and If I Had a Hammer. Yeah, he's a folk singer. Oh, I yeah, okay. I think I know. I think uh, I think when I listen to your next show after you do that, then I'll be more familiar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I well just uh, I just want to say thanks for uh, coming on coming on the show, and I uh, uh, hope you uh, hope you decide what you want to do with the Doctor Phil thing. It would be kind of cool to see you on there or whatever you decide yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'll figure it out. Uh, uh, probably tonight or tomorrow, I'll probably come to some kind of a decision. Say, uh, anybody that's listening to this, too, I just wanted to mention uh, Black Bedsheet Books is uh, one of the best places under the sun to get great independent horror fiction. And if um, you guys want to uh, uh, go take a look and hopefully get some of our books and read them, um, it's at www.downwarden.com slash black bedsheet store. And the official site is downwarden.com slash black bedsheet. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I guess yeah. I, I forgot to ask you. I should have asked you your website. Uh, silly me. That's, oh, that's right. But, hey, that's okay. I'm, I'm glad you were promoting yourself because uh, every time somebody has a website, I always make sure I put their website down uh, down below the, uh, in the comment section or in the link section or whatever. Uh, description section of YouTube, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, you take cool. care, and uh, and we'll we'll definitely talk to you later. Okay, Sean. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no take problem. Bye. <laughs> and that was Nicholas Grabowski, author, known author, and uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, coming on, my fortieth guest of 2013, uh, all together since. This will mark the interview number 60, and I think that's uh, quite the accomplishment. Now we're going to be starting on year two. Well, these interviews haven't been aired yet, so we are pretty much on year two now of my interview series, and also uh, the second half of uh, my interview series, summer interview series, Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I'll put the link down below so you can check out his website and buy some books from him. And, uh, yeah, we'll definitely see you guys uh, in the next one when I interview the legendary folk singer, Trini Lopez. Bye-bye.